Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. My name is Brent, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the CSX Corporation third quarter 2022 earnings conference call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question at that time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press star one. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to turn today's call over to Mr. Matthew Korn, Head of Investor Relations. Thank you, Operator. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third quarter call. Joining me on today's call are Joe Hendricks, President and Chief Executive Officer, Jim Foote, our Outgoing President and Chief Executive Officer, Kevin Boone, Executive Vice President of Sales and Marketing, Jamie Boychuk, Executive Vice President of Operations, and Sean Pelkey, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. In our earnings presentation, you will find our forward-looking disclosure on slide two, followed by our non-GAAP disclosure on slide three. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our President and Chief Executive Officer, Joe Hendricks. All right, thank you, Matthew. And hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our conference call. I'm excited to be here with you today on my first earnings call as president and CEO of CSX. The entire CSX leadership team is here with me this afternoon, and we appreciate the opportunity to discuss our strong third quarter results with you. Our whole team is very motivated to build on our current momentum, strengthen our key relationships, provide better service to our customers, and deliver profitable growth for years to come. We will achieve this through our one CSX culture, which at its core means one team working together to serve all our key stakeholders. As Matthew mentioned, also joining us for tonight's call is Jim Foote, who, as you all know, led this company through its remarkable, remarkably successful transformation over these last five years. Jim cares deeply about this railroad and its employees, and he has already been a great resource during my first several weeks in this role. I'll be happy to have his invaluable advice in the months ahead, and I want to thank him for all the help he has given me personally as I get the privilege to follow him. Jim, on behalf of everyone here at CSX, thank you. Thanks, Joe. As I have said on every earnings call since I took over at CEO five years ago, I am incredibly proud of every CSX employee who has been by my side as we transform this organization into the best run road in North America, a company that's safer, more efficient, more profitable, and far more successful than when we started. I have the utmost confidence that Joe and this team will take this organization to even higher levels of success. This transition process has been underway for a long time. It was critically important that the board and I ensure that a succession plan was in place when the right time came. Having set, seen CSX through the initial phases of our transformation, past some unusual, to say the least, challenges, and now with our operating performance starting to get back to normal, it's the right time for me to step away. Joe is a great guy. He is very talented, and he brings a tremendous amount of operations experience in running a large, complicated industrial company. His years working with a diverse, unionized workforce will clearly serve him very well. It's truly been an honor to serve as president and CEO of CSX, and I wish all of you and everyone connected to this railroad the best. And now back to Joe. Thanks, Jim. I promise you this team won't let you down. I am honored to be here on behalf of the entire CSX team. I've spent the last month traveling all across the network, visiting our facilities and meeting with our customers, our employees, union leaders, regulatory partners, and government officials. At this point, I can tell you two things for certain. First, this is a fantastic railroad. Our people and our infrastructure are second to none, and the principles of schedule railroading that drive our successful, resilient operating model are deeply embedded throughout the company. I knew that CSX was a very impressive place when I started, but I not, did not appreciate how impressive it really is until I saw for myself how this team of skilled, dedicated men and women work together 
to move thousands of box cars and containers for our customers each and every day. Second, for as much as this company has achieved over its transformation during the last several years, there is still so much more that CSX can do. Rail is a low-cost freight solution. Rail is a freight solution, freight solution with low emissions. Manufacturing investment in the United States is accelerating. We have great advantages in this market, and our customers should have every reason to ship more by CSX Rail. But we have to focus our efforts to make this happen. We have to make it easier for our customers to use our service. We have to provide better service to our customers. We have to engage with all of our employees, especially those out in the field serving our customers every day to ensure that we deliver the reliability that we promise. And we have to challenge ourselves to nurture the kind of culture that fosters a nimble, creative, and market-leading company while staying true to the operational discipline that makes this all possible. The concept of one CSX as one team working together to accomplish great things can be very powerful. We have to bring one CSX to life. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But now let's turn to our presentation to review the financial highlights for the third quarter of 2022. CSX moved nearly 1.6 million car loads in the third quarter, third quarter and generated approximately $3.9 billion in revenue. Operating income increased 10% year over year to $1.6 billion, which included the effect of additional labor and fringe expense related to the tentative agreements reached with our union last month. Results this quarter also reflected lower real estate gains compared to last year. Earnings per share increased 21% to 52 cents a share. Our operating ratio for the quarter was 59.5%. Now we turn it over to Kevin, Jamie, and Sean for the details. Thank you, Joe. Turning to slide five, third quarter revenue increased 18% year over year with revenue growth across all markets. Overall volumes were up 2% as modest volume growth in merchandise and intermodal more than offset a minor decline in coal. Merchandise revenue increased 14% on 1% higher volumes driven by pricing that reflects rising cost inflation and higher fuel surcharge revenue. We saw strength in the automotive market where revenues rose 31% on 13% higher volume. Semiconductor challenges continue to ease, and we see significant finished vehicle inventory that needs to move. Ag and food was also a bright spot as improving cycle times, as well as stronger demand for grain, wheat, and ethanol resulted in revenue growth of 25% on 10% higher volume in the quarter. Fertilizers and metals and equipment both saw modest revenue growth despite volume declines in the quarter. Fertilizer shipments continue to be impacted by reduced phosphate shipments and production facility turnarounds. Lower metals and equipment shipments reflect volatile commodity pricing and mill maintenance outages. Intermodal revenue increased 19% on 2% higher volume as yields remain strong and supported by high fuel prices. International shipments were partially offset by lower domestic volumes, which reflected tight equipment availability and softer truck market. Intermodal demand remains strong in the quarter with the team continuing to collaborate with customers and identify new opportunities, including a new international service lane that contributed to growth. Customers continue to recognize our industry leading service product in a challenging market as they seek lower cost and lower emission alternatives to truck. Coal revenue increased 36% on 2% lower volume, as pricing continues to benefit from strong export benchmarks. Volumes remain limited in the quarter due to production issues at the mine, infrastructure constraints at the export terminals, and general manpower shortages. Though our crew availability did show improvement into the end of the quarter. We were also able to reopen portions of our Curtis Bay terminal in September, which provides additional volume opportunities as operations normalize. Demand remains strong, and we see opportunities to move more volume as some of these constraints ease. Trucking revenue increased 26%, mainly due to strong core pricing and higher fuel recovery. 
Other revenue increased largely due to higher intermodal storage and equipment usage fees. The strong sequential increase was driven by continued limited warehouse capacity as, at customer sites. Looking forward, there is obvious macroeconomic uncertainty as the Fed remains committed to raising rates and addressing high inflation. Given this backdrop, the team is highly focused on its efforts to drive strategic growth opportunities that tar target truck and expand CSX's addressable market. As you've seen, our select site program continues to facilitate new customer partnerships. Last month, a key emerging domestic lithium supplier for the EV and battery markets announced the, the construction of a 600 million refining and manufacturing facility on a CSX serve site in Tennessee. We also have several other potential projects in various stages of development and continue to see customers investing in new projects across our network. We're also moving forward with efforts to facilitate ESG solutions for our customers. Before year end, we will be releasing an updated version of our carbon calculator that is integrated within our ship CSX interface. This new calculator will enable customers to drive into much deeper detail and understand in real time the environmental benefits that CSX Rail can provide. Finally, we are also encouraged that service performance is on an upward trend. And we expect to turn the, this positive momentum into additional opportunities with customers. I will now turn it over to Jamie to discuss operations. Thanks, Kevin. Safety remains our top priority at CSX and operating safely is the foundation to our service restoration efforts. In the third quarter, our personal injury rate and train accident rate decreased sequentially. Though we are not satisfied with our performance, I'm encouraged by our success, especially given the number of new employees across the network. As we mentioned last quarter, it is critically important to instill a culture of safety in our new t and &E employees from day one. That emphasis on safety does not end when new employees graduate from training. It requires continuous attention throughout every railroader's career. To reinforce this, we are actively engaging with new hires and all of our employees in the field to discuss recent injuries and accidents to ensure that we take each opportunity to learn from each other. In the fourth quarter, our efforts will continue to focus on making sure our employees are protected from incidents that commonly occur as weather changes. Increased education and awareness of seasonal safety risks will help our team become safer. Turning to slide seven, we're encouraged by the recent improvement in our operational performance. These strong results are a testament to the one CSX team and their unrelenting devotion to serving our customers. If we only look at the third quarter averages, train velocity, dwell, and car, car load trip plan performance, all showed a deterioration versus the prior year, though intermodal trip plan compliance continued to improve 240 basis points. However, the right side of each chart of this slide shows the substantial improvements we have made throughout the quarter and continuing into recent weeks. As shown here, in the most recent full week performance, all of these four key operational measures are above the averages for the third quarter 2022 but they're also ahead of third quarter 2021 performance. We are confident that these metrics show that our efforts to hire, train, and retain new employees are starting to take hold and make a difference for our customers. Though we are encouraged by the operational momentum, we will not let up. We will continue to push forward and take actions necessary until service is fully restored to a level that our customers expect. We are promoting new conductors, allocating the appropriate number of assets, and improving the overall reliability and operational resilience of our network. Turning to slide eight, in the third quarter, active t and &E headcount reached the highest level since March 2020. Though the quarterly average shows a sequential increase of less than 100 employees, we exited the quarter with over 6,800 total. The hiring pipeline remains robust and we averaged over 500 trainees again in the third quarter. We are determined to keep the pipeline full, allowing us to continue filling classes as we work towards our goal of 7,000 active t and &E employees by year end. 
Currently, we have over 700 employees in training and have additionally started locomotive engineer training. The number of conductors that finished training and marked up was down slightly in the third quarter as we cycled lower class sizes from earlier in the year. We anticipate this number to increase in the fourth quarter as the class sizes have remained elevated through the late spring and summer months. Conductor promotions will continue to increase the active T&E headcount. Our efforts to minimize attrition that we highlighted in the last quarter are bearing fruit. New hire attrition in the preceding months have trended lower, and we believe our hiring initiatives and recent pay agreements for new conductors are a contributing factor. I will now hand it over to Sean to review the financial results. Thank you, Jamie, and good afternoon. The favorable operating momentum Jamie discussed was accompanied by strong revenue growth of 18% or $600 million, including gains across all markets. Operating income was up 10% to $1.6 billion as top line gains outpaced expense headwinds from higher fuel costs, inflation, and tentative union agreement impacts that I will discuss in more detail on the next slide. The operating ratio was 59.5%, which as a reminder, includes roughly a 250 basis point ongoing impact from quality carriers. Interest and other expense was roughly flat, as was income tax expense. The effective tax rate in the quarter was 21.9%, lower than our statutory rate as a result of a favorable state legislative change. As such, net earnings of 1.1 billion was up 15%, with EPS up 21%. Now let's take a closer look at expense on the next slide. Total third quarter expense increased $460 million versus the prior year. Fuel was up nearly $200 million, primarily due to higher prices. Inflation remains above historical levels with $82 million of inflation across labor, PSNO, and rents. Labor inflation alone was around $50 million, which reflects the proposed wage rate increase from the tentative union agreement. In addition, we recorded $42 million of out-of-period expenses related to adjusting union labor accruals for the tentative agreements. The most significant piece of this is the impact of the proposed union bonuses. When you think about labor expense going forward, the $42 million is a net catch-up and will not recur. The base labor per employee, excluding this impact, is expected to be the new run rate for Q4 and into the first half of next year. Of course, comp per employee will also be impacted by seasonality, mix, and other factors, but the full impact of the tentative union agreement is now in our base labor costs. Next. Quality and Pan Am combined for $46 million of higher expense, with the increase split about evenly between the two. Quality expenses correlate with higher revenues, while Pan Am reflects the first full quarter of CSX ownership. The Pan Am integration process is well underway, and we continue to receive positive customer indications around strong growth opportunities as we invest to increase the speed and reliability of the former Pan Am network. Real estate gains were $33 million less than prior year, with volume and all other expenses increasing $66 million. While operating fluidity improved through the quarter, our hiring focus remained, and we incurred approximately $40 million of incremental costs related to T&E training, a higher locomotive count, additional intermodal terminal activity, and other congestion-related items. Volume-related costs and higher depreciation represented the balance of the expense increase. We do expect some of the congestion-related expenses to continue into the fourth quarter, but view these costs as the first efficiency opportunities to be realized as we achieve sustained improvements in network performance. Now turning to cash flow on slide 11, year-to-date free cash flow before dividends is down nearly $30 million, but up approximately $120 million when adjusting for after-tax cash proceeds from the Virginia transaction. This is despite close to $225 million of additional capital spend as we continue investing for the health of our network to support the quality and Pan Am acquisitions and position for future growth. After funding all the capital needs of the business, shareholder distributions have exceeded $4.3 billion this year, including over $3.7 billion of share repurchases and nearly $650 million of dividends. 
Additionally, we ended the quarter with a strong balance sheet, including $2.4 billion of cash and short-term investments. Looking forward, we expect to maintain our balanced, opportunistic approach to returning excess cash to shareholders. And with that, let me turn it back to Joe for his closing remarks. All right, thank you, Sean. Now let's conclude with a review of our outlook as shown on slide 12. There's no change to our expectation for double-digit revenue and operating growth for the full year, excluding the effects of the Virginia real estate transaction. While there is uncertainty in the global economy, we feel confident in our ability to deliver on this guidance as we look over the remainder of this year. As we mentioned in our earlier remarks, we are pleased with the positive momentum in our service metrics, and we continue our hiring and training efforts to ensure that we have the resources needed to build on these trends and drive improved network fluidity. We remain committed to returning excess capital to shareholders, as you saw over this past quarter. And finally, we reiterate our priority to building a unified, cohesive culture of one CSX that will strengthen the relationships we have with our employees, customers, and all other stakeholders. This is a great company, and working together, there is so much more that we can accomplish. And that's why I'm so excited to be here. Thank you all. I'll now turn it back to Matthew for Q&A. Thank you, Joe. Now, in the interest of time, I'd ask that everyone, please, limit yourselves to only one question. And with that, operator, please open up the line. Again, if you would like to ask a question, press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. Your first question comes from the line of Ken Hexter with Bank of America. Your line is open. Um, can you talk a little bit about your, your learning curve, you know, why, why the, your, your right background for the role, what you hope to accomplish? And, and I mean, it, it's a general question. Um, and then, I mean, my more specific one would be on trucking, right? You know, like a, a, you talked about the, the ramp, rate ramp, and, and is that something that gets impacted by loose capacity, or is the chemical business just different from the, the trucking side? But, but I'll, I'll stick with the, the big one on, uh, for you, Joe, to start with. Okay, thanks, Ken. Well, I think Jim highlighted a couple of things, but certainly, um, you know, the labor side of the business experience in the automotive industry is certainly very applicable to our situation that we're in now. Uh, when you look at, you know, working through with our labor union partners, tentative agreements and ratification and, and working through those issues. But more importantly, I had the opportunity to be a customer for 20 years of the rail industry and have shared a lot of those experiences with our team and um, have challenged us to continue to look at things from the customer perspective to make sure that we are holding ourselves to a higher standard of service and accountability for our side of this relationship. And I'm really proud of the work that Jamie and the operations team are doing to really show improvement in that area. Um, Jim mentioned that, that, you know, obviously the auto industry is a complexity, complex business and so is the rail industry. There's different types of, types of complexities. Um, but from my background experience, I think a lot of that's applicable. Uh, but I would step back for a second and say, at the end of the day, you know, it's the, it's the workforce, it's the people here that serve our customers. And when we bring everybody together and align around the, uh, our core objectives and around our opportunity to serve our customers better and work together better, we can create an even better CSX. And that's an opportunity for us to bring home and to, and to bring to life. And I'm really excited to be a part of that. I'll let Kevin handle the second part. Thanks, so, Ken, I think if I got your question, if I got your question right on the um, the chemical, you're asking about the chemical trucking quality and- Yeah, uh, Kevin, I, I guess just, you know, obviously what we're seeing in the market is just how uh, you know, pricing collapsing right on the spot basis. And I just want to understand, is, is the chemical business different, uh, you know, in, in terms of the, the revenues we can expect from the trucking and other business? Uh, or is that something that's maybe more sustainable? Yeah, I mean, what you have to remember when we were looking at this business, it's it's a high touch. Um, customers um, really care about product quality, and and the brand awareness that they have for quality is very very high. Um, this is not business that typically moves around, and so uh, what you've seen is um, actually they've done a great job of attracting some drivers this year, and so that's been uh, I think they've done an excellent job versus the market there, and then. 
um, you know, pricing has been uh, very, very good and continues to remain that way. And so that's what we continue to see. It's, it's a very, very different market. Um, it's not uh, people have to be highly trained, highly skilled uh, to do that business. And um, they have a great workforce doing it. Great. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Kevin. Your next question comes from the line of Scott Group with Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hey, thanks. Afternoon, guys. Um, Sean, maybe just any near-term color guidance on the other revenue, the, the labor, comp per employee, anything on operating ratio in Q4. And then, Joe, just sounds like more of a focus on service, uh, culture, so maybe I guess more of a growth focus. I guess, how are you thinking about the ability to grow and improve operating ratio over time, or is it more just about growth, or is it both just your, your big-picture strategy going forward? Scott, I'll, I'll start with the uh, sort of modeling questions. In terms of other revenue, what we've said for a while here is that we do expect it to normalize as, as supply chains, uh, you know, get back to normal. Uh, clearly, that didn't happen here in the third quarter with the, the increase that we saw in, in the other revenue line. Uh, but the expectation remains the same, that we should see it come down, you know, in the fourth quarter and again into next year. Uh, to your other point around comp per employee, um, I think, you know, the best way to think about that is to take the $42 million we talked about, which was the out-of-period expenses related to the tentative union agreement, strip that out of labor, and that's that's the comp per employee run rate that you're probably going to want to use going into Q4 as well as into the first half of next year uh, before the next increase takes place in July of uh, 2023. And I'll let Joe take the second part of the question. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Scott. I think the way I'd like to describe it um, really is to step, how we're looking at this is just to step back for a second. I had the opportunity throughout the summer with all my conversations with Jim and the board to really take a, um, you know, to get educated on scale railroading and to get educated on CSX. So the way I like to describe it, how we're looking at things is, you know, the five guiding principles of the scale railroading are really around improved safety, improved customer service, control costs, improve your asset utilization, and engage, in, and then ultimately um, value and evolve your employees. And so if you took a look, take a look at all five of those things, they're all very important. And so operating ratio is a big part of looking at controlling costs and your asset utilization and, frankly, a number of other pieces that go in there. So clearly that's a very important number for us and a very important part of our objectives. Improving safety, as Jamie talked about earlier, is really important and we'll never, ever get away from that in this industry. The other two areas around our customers and employees are opportunities for us. So how do we leverage our strong operating model that we have here and that, that Jim and the team have built over a number of years to continue to improve the service we provide our, our customers and the experience and the engagement our employees feel as part of one CSX team? Now, how does that lead to growth? I'll, I'll tell you a couple ways. One, with the increased service performance and the manpower that we're putting on, that increases our capacity, which we now can leverage to um, quickly provide for our customers. I've had the opportunity to reach out and have video calls with about eight of our largest customers over the last couple weeks, and almost every single one of them has told me directly to our C a CEO or a COO of all those customers, they've all told me that when you deliver better service and more reliable, predictable service, we want to do more business with you. So we don't have to chase growth um, by trying to do unnatural things. We need to continue to do the things we're doing, leverage our operating model to continue to deliver better service, and with that, and increase the headcount. And with that comes the opportunity to serve our customers better. And because we're lower cost, we're, because we're better for the environment, because of all kinds of other reasons, there's opportunities for us to grow the business that way. And that's the way we look at the opportunity. Through better customer service, through increased capacity through remaining, we have the opportunity to serve our customers and there's more opportunity for us there. Thanks. Your next question is from the line of Ben Nolan with Stiefel. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks. Um, I appreciate the uh, time, guys. Uh, I, I wanted to 
get back to the coal uh, side of it a little bit. Uh, those outages have kind of continued both at the mines and the ports and uh, appreciating that we're we're sort of now getting back to normal. Given the demand that you're seeing from your customers, is, is it possible to give any color as to where, how much incremental uh, volume is achievable, let's say, in the next six months or however long it takes for for some of these uh, bottlenecks to normalize? How, how much better is it than, than it used to be or than it currently is, do you think? Yeah, I think um, – I think probably the gating factor as we get into next year and, you know, we, we obviously are confident in resolving our labor issues is, you know, what can the producers actually uh, produce? Um, coal mines are, um, have been undercapitalized, quite frankly, and, you know, now have a lot of money and they're looking for equipment, reinvesting. And so I, I anticipate it will get better. Uh, we also do have an, a mine coming online middle of next year that uh, will help us. And we have a number of them that are still ramping up. So. Production looks like it could be up next year, um, you know, knock on wood. Um, we probably would have said that uh, last year at this time, too. So uh, there's a lot of things that can happen, as you, as you, um, you know, we mentioned previously on the call. With, we've had some mines that have struggled but uh, are coming out of that, um, you know, here recently into the fourth quarter. So optimistic on the production side. There's clearly a need when you look at the utility coal mines or the utilities that we serve, um, particularly in the south. Uh, they have a lot of inventories they need to replenish, and so we uh, anticipate a lot more consistent uh, deliveries over the next year to really replenish those those levels. and And we've continued to see the export market very, very strong, and um, a lot of geopolitical risk out there in um, Europe and other areas where you know you probably didn't see as much demand a year ago. Uh, continue to have a lot of demand, so. The mines want to serve that. It's profitable for them, and uh, you know we'll, we anticipate to have the resources to be able to deliver going into next year. Okay, I appreciate. Is that sort of if you're just categorizing areas of the business, that probably the one area that we're looking into next year. There's the best growth potential. Maybe to think of it that way. I think on the volume side, you know, we we'll remember, you know, we kind of move with the. Uh, you know, the commodity price on the international market. So depending on what that does, uh, they're at very, very healthy levels uh, today, um, a little bit hot and down from the highs uh, that we saw previously in the year. But that, I think that will be the biggest factor as we look at, you know, overall coal revenue for the next year. Right. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Your next question is from the line of Amit Mehrotra. Your line is open. Thanks, operator. Hi, everyone. Joe, uh, hearty congratulations to you. Wish you the best. And Jim, we'll miss you. I'm sure you'll miss all the 50 conferences and all the questions that we ask you, but hopefully uh, you'll find something else to do. So congratulations to both of you all. Um, Sean, I wanted to ask you about the cost structure, X-Fuel, um, obviously the fourth quarter, um, but I'm really kind of interested in how you think about it for 2023. Um, because you know that we're obviously still in a pretty pretty high inflationary environment, and 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 just related to that, Kevin, you know, once Sean talks about that, can you just talk about you know your confidence in being able to grow the franchise enough to actually see um, um, earnings growth and 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 EBIT growth next year relative to 2022. Um, just what your level of confidence is, is in given some of these idiosyncratic volume factors netted out against obviously some uncertainty on on the macro side. Thanks, Amit. I'll get started on the the cost question. So, I mean, it, it, think about the fact that the the labor cost has now been reset. So we know what our base is kind of going into next year. Um, inflation doesn't show any signs of abating here. Uh, more broadly, outside of labor and recognize that some of our costs are based on lagging indicators, meaning they'll get set uh, based on where, you know, the, the inflationary rates are in 2022 for next year. Um, so there's no doubt we'll be in a, in a sustained inflationary environment going into next year between labor and some of those outside party contracts that we have. That being said, um, you know, we've been carrying extra costs here throughout the year as the, you know, the network has, not operated the way we would have wanted it to based on not having enough crews in the right places. That problem is uh, you know, rapidly getting fixed here. 
You can see it in the numbers over the last couple of weeks. And so, you know, some of those costs are probably going to be a bit sticky going into the fourth quarter. Um, and, but as we get into next year, I think there's, you know, plenty of opportunity for us to, to drive some efficiencies and take some of the cost out uh, to help offset the inflationary headwinds that we're going to see. Yeah, you know, my confidence level, I'll, I'll tell you where my confidence level is. It's, I'm confident in what the team's doing, uh, what we're going to be able to control going into next year. And, you know, there's a number of factors, obviously, that are out of our control, but we have a tremendous amount of initiatives that are uh, really taking hold and are really going to capitalize on the service product that we expect to deliver next year. Uh, as Joe mentioned, uh, there's a lot of customers that want to give us more share of what they're, uh, you know, producing and what they're making out there. And so we have a lot of those initiatives in place uh, that will reap benefits as we move into next year. And that's where my confidence uh, lies. Um, we started the process very, very early in terms of looking those, at those, realizing that there could be different markets uh, that could move around on us next year. Uh, but we know, we know uh, through the, you know, what's happened during the pandemic is the railroad, you know, in particular, all of us really haven't participated in the growth that existed out there. And so that's, that's our objective to position ourselves, no matter what the economy holds, that we're taking our fair share and then more of it. And so that's where the confidence is very, very high across the whole team. And we were just with our short line partners. And I think there's a lot of confidence there that, that they have um, opportunities to go out in the market and, and take share from trucks. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And Sean, I just wanted to follow up just one quick point, what you said. So if, if I look at your cost base X fuel this year, it's kind of like, 7.3 billion. Um, it seems like four or five percent inflation off that number is kind of the right structural costs that go up. But I guess what you're saying is, listen, there's a lot of inefficiencies, 40 million a quarter in 22. So maybe there's an opportunity to actually, if the if the fluidity gets better, there's actually an opportunity to see net inflation lower than that. Is that would you say that's a fair characterization? Well, I mean, I, we're going to see how much cost we can take out based on how well the network spins. But I think the general premise that you're thinking about is uh, is, is the right construct. We got 40 to 50 million a quarter this year that, uh, as we cycle better, should go away. Um, is there more opportunity beyond that? Sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Your next question is from the line of John Chappelle with Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> Jamie, I think last quarter I asked you about capacity as you were still trying to ramp up the labor force. Now it feels like you're pretty close to right-sizing the network from a labor perspective. We've talked a little bit about some of those excess uh, equipment you have on the network today. What would you estimate the spare capacity is today on the network to take on new business, meet this demand that you've been leaving on the table for much of the last 12 months? And I guess the other way to, to phrase it, too, is if we do go into a pretty deep downturn, is that capacity that you'd be willing to kind of flex off the network for a short period of time, or is it something you want to keep to make sure you're never short, uh, again, you know, because of some of the labor issues? Uh, thanks for the question, John. Um, when we take a look at the capacity that we currently have out there right now, it, it's all about people, people, people. And we've been saying this quarter after quarter after quarter. And you're right, we, we are getting closer to uh, our targets, but we're still a few hundred people off. <clears throat> so we have pinch points out there um, that isn't as fluid as we want. You can see in our numbers that we're starting to, uh, the velocities picking up, our dwells coming down, uh, even our trip plan performance is, is creeping up, but, but definitely not where, uh, where we want it to be. So over the next couple of quarters, really, you're going to start to see uh, that momentum continue to pick up. And, and as Sean mentioned, yeah, we, we still have too many locomotives out there, uh, and, and the velocity will help us on that end. And, and, uh, and even our cars online are, are higher than where they should be. So as we continue to move forward, there's, there is a lot of cost opportunity there for us to pull out. But uh, And as we do that and as we move quicker, uh, you know, Easily, I mean, we've, we've said this years ago, but there's easily, uh, you know, the capacity that's out there with the right manpower. You know, we've always said 10, 15, 20 percent capacity with the way that this plant is set up isn't isn't really that big of an issue as long as we have the people to move it. We've got all the assets we need, um, and we are blessed with a fantastic uh, network here at CSX with double track, long sidings, 
and, uh, and, and some good yards that can handle, uh, handle a lot. And an operating team out there uh, that's just doing fantastic. So they've proven to us time and time again that we have that capacity to continue to grow. So this is still a people story for us as we move forward. Um, now, when we talk about that, and, and as you mentioned, I mean, that pent-up demand that has been discussed a number of times from Kevin and, and other folks, you know, what is that pent-up demand that's out there? Is that 4%? Is that 5%? Is that 10%? I mean, I've heard a, a number, a different number uh, of, of what that really can be out there. So if we see a dip um, in the economy, you know, we, we expect to be able to start picking up some of that freight that we can't pick up today. And for us, we just need to, to have a uh, just stay with a forward-looking view on what's going to happen, uh, you know, in, in not just next month or two months from now, but we want to look at nine months from now, ten months from now, and and uh, and really protect that teeny headcount that we have. Uh, and and if we get into any type of situation where we needed to do something different, there's natural attrition. Our natural attrition is eight to ten percent each year. Uh, and if we needed to pause classes, we're able to do that. But uh, ultimately, we want to protect that teeny workforce that's there. Uh, as, as we just mentioned, uh, Ke- uh, Sean mentioned, and I did, I guess, at the start of the question, there's a lot of other levers we can pull uh, throughout the organization. So as a team, uh, I think we would all sit down and have that discussion, and, and we would make sure that we right-size our assets, and railroads are always heavy on assets, so we've got a lot of great cost savings we can do on that end. But all in all, we want to protect that teeny workforce and, and forward-looking. And as if, if some type of a softening in the market comes, we're going to be prepared to come out of it strong. We're going to be prepared to get all the traffic that's out there, and we're going to come out of this stronger than we ever have if we get into that situation. That's great detail. Thanks so much, Jamie. Your next question is from the line of Tom Waterwitz with UBS. Your line is open. Uh, great. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Wanted to see if you could offer maybe a quick thought on uh, operating ratio in fourth quarter versus third quarter. Uh, uh, you know, another railroad reported earlier today, Union Pacific, and they, you know, I think surprised people a bit with talking about worse than normal seasonal uh, OR in 4Q versus 3Q. So I wanted to see if you could offer a quick thought on that. And then for Kevin, um, you know, I think in a higher inflation environment, you'd like to get more price, but the counterpoint to that is that the truck market's weaker and you do compete with truck. Um, so how, how do you think about those factors? Can you get more price because you have more inflation, or should we be mindful of uh, lower truck price, uh, truckload pricing, and, and that's kind of a, a, you know, a barrier to getting more price? Thank you. Tommy, I'll start on the Q4OR question. So, you know, I think typical seasonality, it's not always this way, but usually uh, it gets a little bit worse from Q3 to Q4, and that's primarily because uh, we start to wrap up some of our capital projects and we've got some winter-related expenses that hit. Um, So, you know, all all reason to believe that that same dynamic would occur this year. Uh, Some of the other things that will impact the operating ratio going from Q3 to Q4, um, you know, fuel was a benefit here in the third quarter because of the positive lag that we had. Um, If fuel prices stay relatively constant or follow the forward curve, we would expect that fuel is going to be a bit of a sequential headwind to the OR. It could could be 100 basis points or more uh, based on where the forward curve is right now. Um, So that's, that's just a little bit of noise. Beyond that, you know, hopefully we're able to pick up some uh, some volume as the network starts spinning, uh, take some costs out. So those are good things. And then, you know, I think it's it's a matter of what do we see on the intermodal storage side because that can be a bit of a swing factor for us as we sit right now. Hey Tom, on the um, you know, on the trucking environment and other things, uh, well, I think what you have to remember is, you know, we don't really operate in the spot market when the truckers are getting 30, 40 percent rate increases. That's not um, what was occurring. On our, um, our on, on our end, and you know we have a lot of long-term agreements with customers that you know they they understand. And you know the good news right now, we're seeing our customers get price, um, and they understand you know some of the cost pressures we're facing, and so we're having those constructive conversations with them. And um, I think uh, you know the spreads maybe versus truck aren't as great as they uh, were before, but you have fuel surcharge, which is very high right now, and we know that flows through the truck rates. And so there's still a very very uh, compelling value proposition for for customers to shift from from rail uh, from truck to rail and so we're still leaning into that and there's a lot of appetite um, that we continue to hear 
of uh, you know companies wanting to do that, and for the environmental reasons as well. Okay, so it sounds like you're not overly concerned about the the kind of you know maybe falling truckload contract rates. You're still pretty optimistic on price. Yeah, if I was participating in the 30, 40 percent rate increases, maybe that would be more of a risk. But that that wasn't the reality of you know our business model. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, thanks for the perspective. Your next question is from the line of Brian Ausenbeck with J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, so maybe a quick labor follow-up first for Sean, uh, looking at taking out that $42 million, as you mentioned, uh, getting around 33000 per employee. Uh, I don't know. And so that's not a huge step up, uh, really, from a year-over-year perspective from what you reported. So I think you can help um, decipher that a little bit, something I'm missing. Maybe there's been some incentive comp or maybe mixed with P&M now in, in the full, first full quarter. So any thoughts on that would be helpful uh, as we take that and run forward with it. And then just maybe a quick one for Jamie as well. When you, when you think about the the service recovery and you're performing, I think, best against some of the STB targets that we see in track, um, how long does it – you mentioned the pent-up demand. Like, are you seeing that come back? Are, are shippers still worried about a potential – you know, second slowdown or potential shutdown with the union agree- agreement still not completely in hand. Uh, so what do you think about the near term and how long does it really take for, for you to benefit from some of those service gains? Thank you. Hey, so on your uh, comp per employee question, yeah, the, ma- the math is right. Um, and it really is just the inflationary impact over and above the settlement. So, um, you know, I get to right around 2000 bucks uh, per employee for that, uh, for the 50 million, a little bit more than that. Um, you know, there uh, small mix mix impact from you know having more drivers at quality, uh, which is a little bit lower comp per employee than a railroad worker, but that's really the only offset. Uh, you can already see our, our gains in service with the headcount that we've seen rise. So as we continue to qualify, uh, you know, 20, 30, sometime at some of the weeks coming up here, 40 employees a week. Uh, you should continue to see that trend move forward. Now we've got winter coming, so winter always throws a few challenges at us when we we look at our our service metrics. But our customers uh, are feeling better now. I can tell you that far from where we need to be, uh, and and we're feeling it out in the field. Uh, the discussions that uh, you know we have, Joe and I have spent a lot of time out in the field over the last few weeks, and and the discussion points. Uh, you know, our, our, our men and women who are making this happen each and every day, whether it's on the ground or, or in the towers, uh, on the service side delivering, everyone's feeling it. We're starting to feel the railroad run better. We're starting to feel uh, the numbers of, uh, of the cars moving faster. So, so that's, that's the, the big highlight that we're excited about and confident that we're going to continue to move forward on these metrics. Uh, and look, at, I don't like to comment on any uh, – Anything that's out for ratification, I think it's important that we allow our uh, our union leaders to uh, to have those discussions with the employees that are out there, and and any other ongoing uh, discussions and negotiations. You know, we prefer to really not make any comments on that and and allow uh, the folks who are working on that uh, to just continue doing what they're doing. Understood, Sean. Was there any incentive comp uh, impact in this quarter like there was last quarter? No. Okay, great. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Your next question is from the line of Chris Weatherby with City. Your line is open. Hey, yeah, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, you know, I, I guess there, I think there's been a perception that the the demand level that's out there is decently been above what the service has allowed you guys to carry. And I guess – as you think about some of the macro, you know, cross currents that are out, out there, potential headwinds, is that still the case? Do you think that demand is still, you know, maybe meaningfully above what you're able to provide from a service perspective? And, and I guess as you think out maybe shorter term for Q in particular, you know, should we start to see the weekly carloads begin to ramp up as the service improvement becomes sort of, you know, more realized in the numbers? just want to get a sense of kind of how you guys are thinking about that. And then maybe a second point, but related, is if we do see things get a little bit worse, you know, 
how quickly do you think you can respond in terms of, you know, heads, whether it be you know, your willingness to furlough or just using attrition, Jamie, I think as you talked about a pretty heavy attrition number, is that something that you guys would be able to use relatively quickly in response to slowing demand? Why don't I uh, touch on the first one and maybe I'll hand it off to Jamie on the, on the second uh, part of that. Look, you know, um, I think you're well aware our, our network, uh, more than, you know, well over half of our business touches another network uh, out there, another railroad. And so it's important for the industry to work together to, to capture some of these opportunities we continue to, to talk about. Clearly there's markets like, like housing that um, are seeing, uh, you know, slower signals, um, but there's other areas like coal and um, some of the ag products that, you know, we're seeing uh, great signs there. And um, even if in some markets where there could be some slowdown, I think the, the magnitude of the slowdown is, is what would be the question uh, for us because there's demand that we haven't been able to meet. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of our uh, customers haven't been able to meet uh, because of some of their labor issues, the demand that they see out there. So it's just not all CSX. It's, it's the whole supply chain catching up and we're, we're, you know, one part of that. So where demand ultimately settles out, I think is somewhat of a question, but we do see from a share perspective, and that's an important thing, uh, a lot of opportunity uh, to win wallet share with existing customers. And we we see a lot of new customers willing for maybe the first time uh, coming to us and, and saying, well, well, how does rail, rail work and how, how could we provide a service for us? And those are the things that, you know, we have to lean into as, as we go in and we have some uncertainty in the market. And I'll hand it over to Jamie. Hmm. Well, when I, when I, you know, looking at the question, it, you know, kind of as, as I answered it earlier, we got to stay forward looking. Um, can we pull costs out quick? Well, absolutely we can. I mean, our locomotives, when you think about that, that's a daily cost. You put it down tomorrow, you stop paying for it tomorrow. I mean, these are assets that, that have been around a long time, and uh, we haven't bought a new locomotive in many years, even though we have a rebuild program. Uh, other than depreciation, the heaviest cost of a locomotive is what you use every day on them. So, I mean, that that is one example of uh, of costs that we can handle. And, and on our T&E side, uh, it's important that we continue to uh, to build our teeny workforce where we need it to be. And if we get into a position where things get deeper or things look differently, uh, that attrition, as you mentioned, Chris, it's, it is a heavy attrition rate. And we're able to use that as just a natural way to control our numbers. Uh, and, and, you know, by pausing classes, if we get to that, those numbers will take care of themselves. But uh, we, uh, you know, on the T&E side, and I'm going to keep emphasizing that, we, uh, it's a very important position uh, like any other in the company, but it takes us four to six months to make a train conductor. And if we get softening market and we come out of this, we are going to be prepared to handle all the traffic that comes back at us. And that's a commitment that we're making, and we're going to continue to follow through on that. So all those other levers, there's a lot we can pull on this industry. Uh, we want to make sure that we're prepared to, to come out of any softening if we get to that point. That's very helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Justin Long with Stevens. Your line is open. Thanks. Good afternoon. Sean, are, are there any thoughts that you can share on your expectation for total volumes and coal RPU moving into the fourth quarter? And then, Joe, congrats on the new role. Congrats to, to Jim as well. Going back to the question on growth versus margins, I think it's clear you're focused on improving service, improving the customer experience. Do you think that requires additional costs and a need for margins to take a step back in 2023 to set the stage for future growth? Or do you think there's enough cost opportunity from running a more fluid network uh, so that margins can improve next year? I guess I'll take the coal one. Um, you know, I think you could expect, you know, we're hopeful that some volume step up given, you know, the network uh, starting to get more fluidity and some of our producers uh, starting to perform a little bit better. So, you know, at the margin, maybe a little bit of uh, better volume there. Uh, you have you have access to, you know, the benchmark prices. So those have come down. Uh, they're still very, very healthy, but that would also impact what we would see in the fourth quarter from an export uh, coal uh, RPU perspective, so a little bit um, down probably sequentially there, um, given that, you know, we're already a little bit into the quarter and those those numbers are down from third quarter. 
Yeah, thanks. So this is Joe again. From my perspective, first of all, to be very clear, our goal is to leverage our strong operating model and our operating ratios to give ourselves some more capacity to give that incremental volume opportunity that should be very complementary to our our margin performance. So we should not have to chase share by degrading our margin. Um, in fact, that would not be wise. It takes a lot of volume to make up for a point of margin. Um, so to be clear, um, we're really focused, as you've heard over and over tonight, about the opportunity to keep this momentum going and leverage our, our great operating model the team has put in place here to free up that capacity with the manpower to then allow for us to naturally provide more volume to our customers that they're asking for. And that's really what our focus is for the growth side. Got it. Thank you. Your next question is from the line of Ari Rosa with Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, so, Joe, I, w I wanted to stick on this question of uh, y your background and your experience. Maybe you could talk about what are the learnings uh, that you take from dealing with labor unions in the auto industry that you think carry over to railroads? Uh, and then uh, from a customer standpoint, um, maybe you could give a little more color on what you've shared with your new teammates at CSX about what the customer experience is, uh, is like from a customer standpoint, uh, and maybe what was being missed internally or if there was anything that was being kind of misunderstood uh, internally about what that experience is like. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. So on the labor front, um, you know, I really applaud Jim over the last couple quarters has spoken very openly about the need and the desire of this industry to have a better relationship with its with its union partners. It's a complex relationship. There are 12 different unions um, and there's industry bargaining. Um, so those, those things are a little bit different than the auto industry. But at the core, um, I believe that if you can develop relationships and spend the time listening to each other, you can get into interest-based bargaining, which this team has some success doing here at CSX to find solutions that are in the best interest on both parties and can, can find win-win solutions. So we were able to do that. Um, it took time, maybe decades uh, to get there in the auto industry, but certainly I was fortunate to be a part of that. Um, and it won't take us that long here because we're already, we've already experienced what we've experienced lately. And I think we all recognize if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to end up in the same place in a couple of years. And I don't think any of us want that to happen. So big opportunity there and really leaning into that. I've already met with some of our key union leaders. And Jamie mentioned we've been out in the field talking to employees. We've been talking to union leaders here and out in the field and really just want to start building that relationship so we can form an opportunity to, to work together to find solutions that are in the best interest of our employees. If we put our employees first because they're the ones serving our customers every day, I believe we can mutually find areas of opportunity to, to make progress together. Um, and so on the customer side, uh, you know, challenging our team, especially, um, you know, Steve was coming on the technology side and, and all of us here to think about what would it take to be able to provide the type of service our customers should expect from us um, in 2022 and beyond in terms of not only living up to our commitment around, you know, um, the trip plan compliance or, or having cars ready or those kind of things, but also around visibility, around transparency and communication, because um, some of the frustrations that we experienced on the other side of this was really around transparency and visibility, and there's lots of opportunity for us to get better as an industry and, frankly, as a company in that regard. Um, and just really go back to core principles of, of, you know, why we're here. We're in business to serve customers, and 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 so they pay us to, to and, and they always pay us um, to honor our commitment and we need to do a better job of honoring that commitment. And you've heard Jamie talk about that a lot. You've heard Kevin reference it. And this team is really committed to delivering uh, to our customers in, in a better way. And, you know, CSX was able to show significant improvement really right before the pandemic. This, pl this place was showing dramatic improvement in those kind of metrics. And then of course that little sidewall of that thing that happened with COVID um, we want to get back to there. As Jamie said, that's our base camp. We want to get back to there, and then we want to we expect ourselves to go further from there. So it's really just keeping the employees and the customers at the, at the forefront of everything we do because they're mutually exclusive how they work together. If our employees 
are engaged and feeling good about the culture and about about how they're working together, we can deliver we can deliver better service for our customers. Obviously, help with less attrition and, and attracting more people, and all that stuff reinforces itself. Thanks. Okay, wonderful. Thanks for the thoughts. Your next question comes from the line of Brandon Oglinski with Barclays. Your line is open. Hey, good evening, everyone, and uh, thanks for the question. Uh, Jim, I don't know if you're still on, but congrats on retirement. And if you want to comment on, you know, what you found the most successful the last five years and, and what was left unturned, I think we'd all appreciate it. And, uh, Joe, you know, welcome to Railroading. Uh, and I guess to your answer on that last question, how do you see the one CSX culture fitting into that, you know, customer relationship and focusing on the right priorities? Well, sure. I'm just taking a little nap here. That's okay. Um, the the biggest success is what you're listening to today in this room. Um, five years ago, uh, there wasn't an executive team. It was me. Uh, these guys are all in uh, new roles, all doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job. Uh, I I say it, and, and oftentimes everybody, the, the, the our owners agree. This is the best railroad team. This is the best management team in the railroad business. And it's, it's the thing that uh, puts a big smile on my face, especially today when I'm getting out of here. Thanks, Jim. And uh, I thank you from the bottom of my heart because I'm, I equally am excited about the team we have here, and I'm blessed to be able to, to work with everyone that you've put together, and it is a great team. On your question on one CSX, uh, you know the initiative, the culture initiative was rolled out before I got here um, by the team, which I really um, appreciate the attention and the focus on that. You know, at the end of the day, if we're going to make more progress as a in rail industry, and then here at CSX, we have to have a better relationship with our with our union partners and with our workforce out in the field doing the work that creates the value for our customers every day. So really focusing our energy on, on at CSX about being a, recognizing we're all part of one team, we're all valuable, but we should all be appreciated and we should all be respected, um, and really getting our team to recognize that if we're here to serve and make and help make our employees in the field more successful, um, that ultimately the company and our customers will be more successful. And really channeling that energy in that in that way, we have a great operating model. We have a great process. We have great people. And if we can get people working better together, solving problems, helping us deliver better for our customers, I believe, and I think our team, I know our team believes that we can have a better railroad and better performance overall on all aspects of our business. So that's the, that's the real impetus around 1CSX is, is bringing our team together after all we've been through with the transformation of the operating model and COVID and labor negotiations and all these things, to build from where we are and say, we're going to be one team working together, supporting each other, appreciating each other and delivering for our customers. And ultimately that will deliver better performance financially for our business um, and for our shareholders. And, and but it really starts internally. If we're going to provide better service, we have to really engage with our employees to make that happen. Thanks for the response. Your next question comes from the line of Fadi Shamon. With BMO, your line is open. Thank you. Um, congratulations to uh, both Jim and Joe on on the role and the uh, retirement. Um, I want to ask a question about kind of theme that was going on um, kind of all night uh, on this call. You know, I think that there is, I believe, agreement generally that rails can grow share across many markets because of cost, environmental benefits, and so on. But, but I think the issue has been, and what we hear always from shippers, is not just the level of service, but the consistency, the the, the uh, consistency of service over seasons, over cycle. And I'm not sure, coming out of this pandemic and some of these labor issues we've experienced in the last year, whether you approach that kind of different framework for for the operation and, and kind of capacity going forward. Is is there? Um, kind of framework where, where um, you know, you look at surge capacity maybe differently than you have in the past, or is there a, a, an opportunity maybe on labor agreement to, to change how um, availability of crews is managed through, through those kind of times? 
to kind of remove some of that volatility that we see in service, which I think has been probably a big hindrance to the growth uh, in the past. Well, I'll take this one on, buddy. And I, I believe, um, you know, we, we're we're coming out of this stronger than we than we ever have, and we're coming out of this learning lessons. Okay, if if we haven't learned lessons along the way as an industry, if not just CSX, then we haven't been watching or listening to our customers and seeing what's going on out there. So, uh, yes, is there opportunities with our union agreements? There absolutely is. Let's let's get past the ratification now before. We get any comments, but as Joel mentioned, the relationships between our unions and as we continue to do things differently and, and improve those relationships, it's going to open up opportunity for us to retain employees uh, like we haven't been able to before and, and provide uh, possibly a schedule, and Jim has talked about this a number of times, provide a, a better schedule for our employees um, so when they come to work, they come to work with a smile on their face, they come to work rested, they come to work uh, being that facing, uh, you know, the, the face that, that delivers cars to our customers to the docks and they have a positive attitude and they're, they're wanting to grow this company. And, and believe me, our employees want us to grow. There is no question about it. They want us to give them the tools to grow and they want us to give them the opportunity to, to do that. So, um, you know, that, 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 that's a big opportunity as we move, we move forward. Uh, we are staffing up. We are staffing up to make sure that we can handle the demand that Kevin and his team brings forward to the operating team. Uh, Kevin and I talk every single day. Uh, you know, weekly we go through numbers together. Our teams are very close. We know where the opportunities are, there, are out there. A number of great announcements that have been made through Kevin and his team through some big wins uh, on customers who are opening up facilities on us. So, uh, you know, going forward over the next couple of years, those are great opportunities. And we're going to make sure we're staffed up for that. We've got locomotives in storage. I've said that a number of times. I think when I took Joe into uh, Waycross and he saw the number of locomotives we had in storage out there, it's a surprise. Uh, I like to call that the field of dreams. And, you know, one day maybe we'll have all those locomotives pulling, pulling freight and pulling tonnage out there. And if we get to that point, we know that we've really grown this company beyond where we think we can. So we are, uh, we are continuing to prep ourselves to move freight, uh, I think I answered the, the, the question on what happens if there's a bit of a downturn in business. We're going to stay forward-looking, and we're going to try to drive this opportunity like it's never been done before. And if there is a softening, we're going to make sure that we are fully prepared, no matter uh, no matter how it comes, to provide that service to the customers like they've never seen before. And that's our goal. And, and you're right. That's the theme you've heard tonight. And I'm happy that you said that that is the theme you've heard because I believe all my colleagues and, and everyone around the the table here, we all believe the same thing. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Ravi Shankar with Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. A couple of quick cool ones. Uh, Joe, uh, probably the last one, hopefully you'll have to do, is still wearing your auto hat uh, on. But, but can you just help share with us what do you think the future of autos as an end market is for the railroads, i.e., uh, nearshoring, production bases. Uh, when do you think the the, the the chip shortage eases, et cetera, et cetera, and kind of how that industry kind of ramps up in the near term and long term? And as a follow up, uh, any commentary on um, I think today the, the 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 rails rejected BMW ads uh, kind of. Uh, uh, asks uh, in, in the labor contract, and then like some are speculating this increase is likely of a strike. Uh, kind of how, how does that eventually end up? Thank you. Okay, thanks. I'll take the second one first, and then I'll talk about the autos. Um, as Jamie mentioned, you know, we're going to let the, the process play itself out. We have a lot of respect for our union leaders, and, and we've reached tentative agreements, and, and they're in the ratification process. Um, I think Union Pacific talked a little bit about some of the issues with BMW ED this morning. Um, and, you know, I think the opportunity here is for us to really just work together to let the, let the process play out. We want to respect that process on the union labor side. On the auto side, I mean, there's a lot of things going on. I mean, there's been a number of significant investments, announcements in the, especially the Southeast, um, many of which have been uh, we've been the beneficiary of having a relationship with or having the rail access to. 
um, whether, it's, whether it's on EV batteries or whether it's on new manufacturing assembly plants. So I think you'll continue to see, uh, obviously, with the government's help, uh, increased production um, for things that support electrification of the automotive industry. And we were well positioned to take advantage of that, frankly, with how these are playing out. Uh, I'm not going to comment on the chip shortage, but you are hearing from the autos that, you know, production is picking up. We're seeing more opportunity to deliver more vehicles. So that's a good thing for us in the near term. Um, and, you know, we're watching what's happening on the demand side, but certainly we're seeing increased opportunity to deliver more vehicles for our automotive customers um, here at CSX. And uh, longer term, of course, there's significant investment going in electrification um, and we're seeing, you know, again, that opportunity to be a part of that as, as CSX has been a successful part of a number of these announcements. So that will continue, and we're excited to be a part of it. Thanks. Thank you. Your final question comes from the line of David Vernon with Bernstein. Your line is open. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, Jim, congratulations and good luck. Uh, hopefully we can stay in touch down the road. Um, wanted to uh, come back to you, Jamie, on the headcount. The, the the guidance says we're going to um, continue to increase transportation headcount to restore service. Can you frame um, what your expectations are for how large you need to get the headcount uh, to get the service levels where you want it to be? And as you think about adding those resources into next year, um, should we be expecting the training rooms to be as full in terms of the, the productivity drag that we're, we're, we're going to be trying to model out here? Um, well, thank you for that one. Uh, I would say, you know, our target, as we said at the end of this year, is 7,000 active uh, T&E. We are, uh, you know, we are pushing up to 72 um, as we move forward. And look, we're, we're doing locomotive engineer training. We don't want to get ourselves caught behind on that. We're still good for a number of years, but we want to take advantage of that. And, and the trickiest part of head count on the railroad is getting the head count in the right spot. And, uh, you know, the, as market conditions change and as things move around out in the field, uh, we're very fortunate that right now we have uh, over 60 employees who have taken temporary transfers to areas where we're short right now and we're hiring. Uh, and we're taking advantage of some of those areas where we do have excess employees. So uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with, uh, with, with where our numbers are heading. And, uh, and, and, you know, let's see what that number looks like as we continue to move forward and see where, where our, uh, our attrition rate continues to take us to. But, yeah, absolutely, heading into next year, we will see our class sizes most likely uh, start to decline to more normalized uh, attrition rate. We're going to make sure that we keep up with attrition. We don't want to fall behind on that. And we mentioned that that's an 8 to 10 percent, depending on uh, which area of the network, as we continue to right size and, and right size in the right places. So. Yes, you will see our class sizes start to drop when we start hitting those numbers, and uh, and we feel quite confident that uh, that we're heading in the right direction with those numbers. I I, I wish I had the, the head count um, today that we needed, but it'll take a little bit of time and we'll get there. But you will see you will see those class sizes uh, drop to normalized class sizes as we move forward. Appreciate the and question. Then, and if I could just squeeze one little one in there at the end here. Um, as you think about the attrition rates on the recent graduates, you know, has have you seen any or noticed any differences um, as a result of some of the, the the changes that are coming in the contract? Are you seeing like uh, maybe some of the the, the 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 labor stick around a little bit longer than maybe we saw earlier in the pandemic when you were trying to ramp up? Yeah, we're definitely seeing a change lately, and I, I would not necessarily put that to the contract at this point in time since it's still out for ratification. I think that is the hard work that our labor group has done and the great uh, relationships that we're continuing to build uh, with our union groups on uh, on changing pay scales. The pay scale where we went from uh, a step scale of uh, 80% uh, oh, it takes over five years before you get to 100%. Uh, as soon as we started offering to our new hires that, that they would make the same money as the, the person sitting next to them in the cab, uh, we definitely saw a, uh, a change in our retention rate uh, in a positive way. So we are we are doing things differently, and and I think as we continue to make some of those changes and build those relationships, that's only going to get better as we move forward. Right, I appreciate you uh, letting me squeeze that in there. Thanks again. 
I would now like to turn the call back over to Mr. Matthew Korn. Thank you, Operator, and thank you, everyone, for your interest in CSX. We look forward to speaking with you again on our next quarter. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for participating. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect.